The first reading is from Zechariah, the ninth chapter, page 953 in the Pew Bible. <clears throat> Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, victorious, or righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. We will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As you are because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much as to you. The second reading is from Philippians, the second chapter, page 1179 in the Pew Bible. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The gospel today is from John, the 12th chapter, page 1078 in the Pew Bible. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, like the crowd of old, we've come to your parade crying, Hosanna, Lord, save. We have bought and sold to compromise with many things religious and many things in the world. So as of old, may you proceed now to cleanse this temple, the temple of our hearts, to properly worship you. Come now and honor your word among us, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. 
Amen. Undoubtedly, the uh, congregational disappointment will be palpable today. It's Palm Sunday, and it's a very festive celebration in the church calendar. Uh, we have come expectantly with a celebratory procession with waving of palm branches, and you've anticipated that some young buck will be up here waxing eloquent and preaching with pizzazz. Instead, you find out that the messenger is uh, not very vigorous. Uh, unlike pastors Steve and Corey, uh, in order to get myself to this point before you, I probably have ended up looking like my best Tim Conway uh, imitation. Uh, and I'm not likely to distance myself from the pulpit because the neuropathy in my feet means that I can't really sense where I am and so I need to anchor myself uh, to something. It's sort of like uh, knowing that the, that the floor has a slight incline to it and you can't really uh, feel it. It's like, it's like going up to Jerusalem. It's like trying to ride a young donkey. You're unsure, you're unsteady. It's a bumpy ride. So if that disappoints you, consider me just a living illustration because you're experiencing something of what it was like for the audience at that original Palm Sunday observance. Because based on the rumors of miracles, such as the raising of Lazarus from the dead, Jesus' disciples and the multitudes that gathered expected a messianic march, a declaration, a, a, a revolution, something militaristic was supposed to break out. And they got caught up in the moment with the expectations that were not to be. Even back then, everybody loved the parade. And the good news of this one was that there wasn't even any clowns to frighten little children. When Jesus entered Jerusalem publicly, now for the last time, he did it in a manner that very purposefully fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah 9 and verse 9, which has been read for you. That's the text we'll be in primarily uh, today. In Matthew 21, verses 4 and 5, plainly tells us that this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, the prophet Zechariah. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In John 12 and verse 15, that apostle quotes Zechariah 9, 9, as was read from us, for us, but adding on beyond what was read is verse 16, where he says, at first the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. So it wasn't until after Christ's resurrection and ascension that many of these things began to make any sense to them at all. For, for literature fans, we might think of it as being like a Charles Dickens novel. All along, there are, from the very beginning, seemingly obscure and perplexing, very odd, unique, uh, peculiar characters and words and events that are happening throughout the novel. And it's only at the very end where he wraps it up and you discover that every bit of it, every event, every word, every character, every peculiarity of it proves to be central to the, to the meaning and revelation of the story. It was that way for these first disciples, and it's that way for us as well in God's story. Clearly, this bit concerning uh, the riding of the donkey went right over their heads, and uh, of not only of the disciples, but of the crowd. But post-resurrection and post-ascension, they realized they'd witnessed the actual fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9 on that Palm Sunday. And so it is for you and me. There are some things about Old Testament prophets and even New Testament prophecy as well that are mysterious to us. We read them and, and we say, I can't figure it out. It's because they haven't happened yet and we don't know the way in which they are going to particularly be fulfilled. The key, of course, is Jesus Christ himself. Revelation 19 and verse 10 tells us it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. 
And St. Paul informs us in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20 that no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. In other words, everything in history, in the present, in the future, it all needs to be seen through the lens of Jesus Christ, who is the key to prophecy. So let Zechariah this morning tell us about the meaning of Palm Sunday as we read it in the light of its fulfillment in Jesus. It won't be irrelevant to our situation in this present day. The prophets, you see, mostly, mostly uh, prophesied uh, highlight experiences, mountaintop experiences. And so they didn't always get to see or even to report the, the space and the time and whatever other events and so forth uh, are, are between those highlighted peaks of the mountains. But when we consider this prophecy in Zechariah, we have to see that it has to do with our future as well. And part of the proof of this is the beginning uh, of Zechariah 9 in verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. Notice that those words, this is going to be obvious, are addressed to the people and the offspring of Jerusalem. But secondly, think about the, what Paul tells us in Galatians 4.26, that the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. We too, then, are the offspring of Jerusalem. And so this prophecy has meaning for us beyond what's already fulfilled there at that first Palm Sunday. Maybe we don't think that this prophecy involves us because we're Lutherans. We're a, a, a stoic kind of people, oftentimes from a very uh, a genetic base that's not given to a whole lot of outward expression and display. But I grew up in Minnesota, and uh, I am half uh, uh, of one of that genetic base, and I submit to you that there are times, usually at Minnesota Vikings games, when even Scandinavians are known to shout and to hoop it up. Not all of life is like that, though, is it? Most of the life is, is dangerous and dreary and hardship. It was for the ancient Jews as well. That's why God created so many of those festivals that clearly were markers along the way, various celebrations. And so we need to, in our day, church festivals periodically, like Palm Sunday, properly understood. Zechariah refers to it as an occasion to rejoice greatly and to shout. Well, why should I do that, you, you ask? You see, your king comes to you, Zechariah prophesies as the answer. We're here, and King Jesus is here too. That's really more cause for celebration and shouting than a game. Good news, folks. The king who creates joy and celebration has come among us and is coming among us. No other king either has or will be like him. So why is this such good news? You think about history, how many evil, wicked kings there have been. But this one, we're told, is righteous. That's the first thing that Zechariah says about him. He isn't wicked and evil. The tables are about to be turned, not only in the temple, but, but also in, in all of history and in cultures. The lowly are going to be vindicated, and they rejoice because of it. A second way in which the crowd is made happy is found in the word victorious here. The New International Version used to translate this before 2011 as, quote, having salvation. The Hebrew word literally that it's based upon literally means saved. But to call the coming Messiah saved is kind of odd. So some translators cannot bring themselves to render it that way. They, they reject that because they say, hey, that can't possibly be. We're the ones needing salvation, not Jesus. So they translate it as he's bringing salvation, he's having salvation, or, or they get caught up in the moment here, even as the original audience did, and, and think of it as victorious. But actually the context points to the possibility that this humble king who is bearing tidings of peace on a simple donkey is going to need to be treated in such a manner that he needs to be saved. 
not from his own sin, like us, obviously. He's the sinless one. That's the victorious part. He comes, and he's been sinless all the way through. But he needs to be saved from our sin. He needs to be saved from our scoffing, our unjust trial and accusations, our beating of him, our murder of him. How do you get saved after you've been murdered? Well, in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 23, Peter declares, You, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has saved Jesus from the grave. So the point of verse 9 here in Zechariah is that the king is coming as a peacemaker. He is strong, but he's lowly and he's riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the donkey. He's meek, and if he's that humble, it may not be so strange to see that he's going to need to be saved from attack. He's going to need to be saved from danger. So what does that riding on the donkey mean? It means that coming after the word lowly in our text here, it's reinforcing the idea of his humility and his meekness. In the Old Testament, kings and princes and judges now and then did ride on donkeys, but they never rode on them when they were going to war. That's when they brought out these terrific uh, warlike steeds. They were called war horses. It's where we get the word from. This king instead is coming as a peacemaker. Luke's gospel in chapter 19 and verse 41 says of this, of this uh, Palm Sunday event, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Just a few verses earlier in, in chapter 19 there of Luke, verse 38 tells us the crowd was shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. He was coming on a donkey as a peacemaker. Not just peace on earth between mankind and mankind, between nation and nation, between political party and political party, between man and woman in a marriage or in your neighborhoods or wherever it is. Not just that, but peace, you recall there in verse 38, is in heaven between God and man. He's saying to us as he comes, I'm approachable. I'm not against you. I'm for you. He made peace between sinful people and holy God. As Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, he says he did it through his blood shed on the cross. He's so humble that he's actually willing to be rejected and despised and beaten and killed for you. Because God saved him from death by bodily raising him again, he can now save anybody. He comes to you and me this morning as the peacemaker. He's laid down his life so that he might make to you and to me a genuine offer of reconciliation. He has come farther towards you in his humility than you could ever go towards him in his deity. There's still time in your life to hear Jesus say, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, because the adulating crowds would soon, very soon, turn on him. They didn't want this humble king. They didn't want his offer of peace and reconciliation. As a member of the Beatles said in my lifetime, a few decades ago, uh, they said, we're more popular than Jesus now. It was scandalous when it hit the front page of the newspapers. And I remember looking at that and thinking, good, people are upset about it, but I wasn't upset by it because, you know what, I'm thinking of this Palm Sunday event, and there's the popular Jesus. The popular Jesus is going to be unjustly crucified, dead, and buried. They hated the popular Jesus. Sometimes I get nervous when Jesus gets popular because I suddenly realize uh, we've probably gone too far and we're not telling the whole story about Jesus. John chapter 12 and verse 19 tells us 
about this. They said, he says, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And then again, in the apocryphal book, which uh, uh, many of us Protestants wouldn't even uh, have access to, but in the apocryphal book of Wisdom in chapter 2, we get some prophetic insight into the minds and machinations of Christ's enemies there arising out of this Palm Sunday event. Listen to the great detail with which it is prophesied. Quote, the wicked said among themselves, let us beset the just one because he is obnoxious to us. He sets himself against our doings, reproaches us for transgressions of the law, charges us with violations of our training. He professes to have knowledge of God and styles himself as a child of the Lord. To us, he is the censure of our thoughts Merely to see him is a hardship for us because his life is not like that of others and different are his ways. He boasts that God is his father. Let us see whether his words be true. Let us find what will happen to him. For if the just one be the son of God, he will defend him and deliver him from the hand of his foes. With torture, let's put him to the test that we may have proof of his gentleness. Let us contain, condemn him to a shameful death. These were their thoughts, but they erred, for their wickedness blinded them, and they knew not the hidden counsels of God. Neither did they count on the recompense of holiness, nor discern the innocent soul's reward. So now let's move on into verse 10 quickly in Zechariah 9. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river, which means the river of Euphrates, to the ends of the earth. His reign then spreads from Jerusalem to all Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth to anyone who is far from Jerusalem. Is anybody far from Jerusalem here today? He's reaching out in peace to you right now. He loves peace. He hates war. He detests hostility. This humble, righteous, crucified, saved, peacemaking king will one day, maybe soon, return to earth as ruler over the nations. There will be a judgment. And only those who have received his terms of peace will enter his kingdom. King Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. He commands all people everywhere to repent and trust in him alone. And you and I are gladly included clearly in this prophecy from God today. It's utterly important that you accept his humble terms of peace today. At the Jesus parade this day, don't be like the person in the true story that has been told by Elwyn Davis, who uh, lived in Great Britain and uh, worked with the Bible Christian Union over there. He tells the story of, of, at the beginning of World War II, how Nazi Germany invaded the Netherlands by air. Their, their uh, plan was to land at a small airstrip near The Hague and they rush in and capture Queen Wilhelmina. Well, in God's sovereignty, what actually happened is, just in time, the British forces spirited the Queen to London, where she directed the government in exile for the Netherlands through all the rest of the war. And after peace was declared, finally, the Dutch, who were carefully trained uh, in, in uh, horsemanship, trained 400 beautifully matched black uh, horses and presented them to the king of England, the monarch there, as appreciation for what they'd done for their queen. At the time of their first appearance in, in England, these horses, uh, Queen Wilhelmina happened to be celebrating her golden jubilee. And so she was invited. She was going to ride in the royal carriage with King, J uh, uh, King uh, George of England. Uh, a, a Dutchman was visiting the Davies in London at the time, 
and was very eager to see uh, his queen. So they went to the procession, and what they found was 200 magnificent black horses stepping in precision before the royal carriage, mounted by household cavalry with burnished breastplates and, and scarlet plumes. And, 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 and then behind the carriage was 200 more, all decked out in the same way, with the same precision, the sound of the hooves, the murmurs and yells of the crowd, the jingle of the harnesses, all of this, uh, Davis tells us, was, sounds so British, quote, overwhelmingly splendid, unquote. And as the parade neared, the Dutchman could no longer contain his excitement. He shouted, the horses, the horses, the horses. And after the procession, Davis turned to him and asked him, did you see your queen? Did you see the king? No, he said. Where were they? He'd been so overwhelmed by the parade, he'd completely missed his sovereign. The person of this righteous, humble, peacemaking, saving king is today's purpose, Palm Sunday's purpose. Don't miss him or his offer. Amen. Now let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we die and rise with Christ in baptism, may we also live and serve like Christ. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.